Good morning, Hope Reform Baptist Church. It's good to be here, isn't it? Good to celebrate in baptisms. And it's good to open the Word of God. So can you go to uh, Galatians chapter 3? Next week in the morning, we will be starting our journey through the book of Hebrews. And we'll be starting in chapter... There we go. One fan. My wife's excited. Uh, the rest of you will get there. Uh, Hebrews next week in the morning. And we will be studying Judges in the evening, pretty much to take us up to Christmas about the anti-heroes and the warfare uh, uh, through which God waged war in the Judges. Uh, and that'll be in the evening. So I'm looking forward to that. This morning, our, our time has been one of encouragement to the baptism candidates uh, who we just saw baptized um, uh, to both encourage them and to remind them what it is they're entering into today, what blessing they have been given by God. But kind of like when you go to a wedding, it's not your wedding, uh, uh, and you've probably been there, you've been invited, it's a cousin, it's a friend, it's somebody at church, and you're watching the wedding. Now, if you're a married person, if you're a single, it's painful. Uh, if you're married, it's delightful. If you're single, you're, you're sitting there hoping, wishing, dreaming for that day when you're standing there. If you are married, you're standing there remembering when you stood there. And it's like that when we watch baptisms, is that it's beautiful and delightful. It's a blessing for those being baptized. If you're not baptized, it should be something in you that, that draws out your heart. That you, I want to be baptized. I, I believe, but I've not yet been baptized. Then you should. If uh, you've not been saved, then hopefully in the watching of baptisms, there's something stirring within you that, look at this person, a self-professed sinner, don't seem any better or worse than me, apparently, and here they are accepted into the loving arms of God and the community of a church. That should stir you, an invitation. And, and so also for those who have been baptized in the past, we sit and we watch baptism. We go to the Word and remember what baptism is and we're refreshed, we're renewed, we're exhorted to live up to that which we professed in baptism, that Jesus Christ is our Savior and our Lord. In Galatians 3, I trust you're there now. I'll go. We are in verse 27. Here's the single verse of our consideration this morning. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ... Have put on Christ. May God bless this word in our midst this morning. Amen. He is speaking to those who have been, we could rearrange the words or retranslate it and insert the word truly. Whoever has been truly baptized were baptized in a spiritual moment. What we just witnessed in baptism was, yes, physical, but this is what we mean historically when we speak of a sacrament, is that it's a physical thing done that is endowed or utilized by the Holy Spirit and blessed to our hearts in a spiritual way. That is that all those who have been truly baptized, which means baptized duly and properly, uh, baptized since becoming a believer, those who have been truly baptized were baptized in to Christ Jesus. So that's really the premise. All those who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we'll look at a moment, uh, what does it mean to put on Christ and what a blessing that is, even in the sounding of it. But first we need to just get our minds around who the identity is being addressed. Who is it? Who is it that Paul is talking to? You, as many of you who were baptized into Christ, verse 27. As many of you as were baptized into Christ. He's really, if we can simplify it, uh, he's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to the baptized. And in an ideal world, those shouldn't be two different circles. They should be really overlapping. That everybody who is a Christian, in the New Testament sense and to the apostles, they'll assume you've been baptized. This is the, the pattern from the earliest days. As Peter preached, it says, as many as received his word, who believed, were baptized. So the Great Commission comes down to us from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Go preach those who believe, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so uh, basically in the apostolic mind, in Paul's mind, he wants to assume, though he knows there are some Christians who have not yet been baptized, or there are some Christians who are disobediently putting off baptism, or there are some Christians uh, who don't even realize they should be baptized. Of course, there's, there's those caveats. He's not saying you're not a Christian if you haven't been baptized. But we just get a, get a, get a, 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 a clue, a view into Paul's sort of practical theology that when he speaks to Christians, he assumes a baptism. Much like when he speaks to Christians, he assumes a local church attendance. There are these sort of assumptions of basic discipleship in the New Testament that give rise to this sort of language. All of you who were baptized, and then he says something that is true of all Christians. 
Well, so then in Paul's mind, all Christians should be baptized. So connected, so related, so immediate in the New Testament is the relationship between placing your faith in Jesus and then getting baptized in water uh, to symbolize that. Those things are so interconnected in the New Testament that those who are Christians could be assumed to be baptized. So application, if you have believed on Jesus, be baptized. Moving on. So in the New Testament, the relationship then, this is the second part of this, the relationship between you being converted, placing your faith in Jesus, turning away from false religions and life of sin, giving up on your own self-righteousness, hearing the gospel, believing in Jesus by faith, joining a church and getting baptized. That whole conversion experience is so interconnected as really one big event in uh, in Paul's mindset that sometimes he uses the language of baptism or coming to faith as interchangeable. He's not saying that getting baptized regardless, you know, you pick one of them, they both do the same thing. You can either believe in Jesus by faith, or you could just get baptized, and it's one of the two. They both do the same thing, not what he's saying. But, but so related is faith, and then expressing that faith in baptism, so related is the gospel which saves you, and then baptism which symbolizes the gospel, so related to those two things, the preaching and evangelism ministry of a church and the sacramental ministry of the church, so related are they that sometimes he speaks of them interchangeably. And it can give rise to some confusion. So for example, Romans 6, he says, all of us who have been baptized were baptized into, uh, uh, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Colossians 2, he says, we were buried with Jesus, which is language for salvation. We were buried with Jesus in baptism. Well, you want to ask the question, was it baptism or was it faith that saved me? And of course, the theological answer is, it is Jesus Christ who saved you. It is faith alone which received Christ's salvation. But again, in the Paul mind, the baptism and salvation are so connected, sometimes he uses them interchangeably. Now, sometimes people jump on this and try and make a case for baptism saving people. So when we read Galatians 3.27, we understand all he's saying is, you baptized Christians, you have put on Christ. But some people will jump at this and say, well, look, uh, baptism puts you into Jesus. That is simply the immersion in a body of water. Or maybe a, a, they call it baptismal regeneration. If the priest wears his hat and gown and says the right words and sprinkles you or pours you as a baby. And this is, this is a large portion of Australians. I, I don't know if you're doing evangelism. Uh, much of my evangelism over the years, I'll, I'll be talking religion, uh, you know, sort of backgrounds with people. And like, yeah, yeah, I'm Christian. I'm, I can't remember what I am. I think Anglican or something. I think maybe, maybe I was Lutheran. I remember my mum, they put me in a dress when I was like four or something. I can't remember. I, I'm something. Uh, but yeah, I've done that. I got the... I got the I got the sprinkle or, 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 or any other kind of thing. Now, now, some people will jump at this and go, if you have been, uh, there is something powerful in and of itself in the baptism, in the water act that gives, that grants, that imparts salvation. Now, that's one way. It's a very wrong way to take Romans 6 or Colossians 2 or Galatians 3 and say, look, he says baptism gets me into Jesus. It's not at all what Paul would say. Rather, faith connects you to Jesus. Jesus saves you through faith. And it is baptism which symbolizes that faith and that gospel of Jesus. So it is not at all confusing, or it's not surprising at least, that in the New Testament we see these languages so interrelated and sometimes interchangeable. He's speaking to the baptized Christians. And in case there's any confusion about that, about, well... But is he saying, I mean, could Tom be wrong? Very unlikely. Could Tom be wrong uh, that verse verse 27 is hinting that baptism itself, the act of the what, it does make you a son of God. Is is there anywhere maybe that's watertight, mind the pun, but feel free to laugh, that's more watertight that assures us that it's not baptism, the water act that actually saves. And I don't even need to get you to turn anywhere because it's the very previous word and phrase and verse of today. So look at verse 26. Paul has already argued, as opposed to commandments and obedience and ceremonies of the Old Testament law or any other ceremonial laws, as opposed to all of that, verse 26 says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. 
through your baptism, through the sprinkling, through the, the, the plunging, through the priest's words, through the, the prelate's incantations, and through your, your, your confirmation or, or your signing. And when you became a church member, that's how you became a son of God. Amen? No, thank you. Thank you for the silence. No, no, not at all. Through faith, men and women who are enemies of God are made sons of God and heirs, verse 29 will say, heirs according to the promises that God has made previously. Faith and faith alone joins us to Jesus Christ. The New Testament expectation is that those who have been saved by their faith in Jesus will also be the baptized people. Those who have given their public, their internal, their church testimony in going down into the water as the New Testament shows us and rising again to give testimony to the new life they now have in Jesus. So Paul is speaking to people who have put their faith in Christ, who have been converted, who have raised to spiritual life and, are show, and have shown this in their baptism. So to those people, what does he say? He says that you have put on Christ. We're going to look at a bunch of benefits uh, that are, well, three, that are unique to those who are in Christ, those who have believed, been baptized, those who are saved by faith alone, expected to be baptized. Paul will say, you have put on Christ. And there's a whole, we'll go through a couple of benefits, but first we just need to mark this. Um, there is probably here with us uh, individuals, maybe you've been here a long time or you're visiting, and your situation is that you maybe were even baptized as a kid or something, or, or at least you've done enough religious acts that you think you're, you're probably going to slide into the, into the right lane on your way into heaven, or, uh, or maybe you've had no religious background, but your general uh, posture towards God and heaven is... That God is a gracious God. You hear him called a father. You hear that he's merciful. He sent his son, et cetera, et cetera. I hear that there's quite a story. He's merciful and kind. And so I, I trust that when I see him, when I've lived my life and I've done what I want to do, and I finally see him, after maybe he's apologized for a few evils that he did to me in my life, maybe after that, he and I will really hash out this whole sin, not being perfect, meeting his laws thing, and being so kind and a good neighbor and a good mate, um, I'm sure she'll be right. Now, you are right to posit that, that God is merciful and God is gracious and God is kind. However, God has, God has concentrated, and I guess we could say invested, God has placed, God has worked all of his mercies and all of that kindness that you're banking on, he has deposited all of that into Jesus Christ, which means that if you are not in Jesus, you don't have any of his mercies. And whatever mercy you do have now will run out on judgment day and God will meet you without that mercy because his mercy will be only in Jesus. His grace, which you hope you get plenty of, will be in Jesus. It is in Jesus. His mercy, his kindness, his love, his forgiveness, it's all bundled up in Jesus. So if you want to receive any of God's mercy, kindness, and grace, the, the most important exhortation to you this morning is make sure you're in Jesus. Don't try and do it on your own. Make your own way. Earn your own righteousness. Uh, argue uh, things out with God and hash out an eternal plan. None of that is an option. The only option that God has given, and it's a tremendous salvation and gift, is Jesus Christ. Have you believed in? Have you been saved by? Have you been converted by Jesus Christ? If yes, you have heaven before you. If no, you have hell to wait. And so Paul speaks about the great benefits that there are in Jesus. You have put on Christ if you have believed upon him. This is an amazing, this is a twofold thing. Not only, not only did he spare us, forgive us, uh, uh, clear out our debts, which would have sent us and found us in an eternal hell. And, and, and we, would have des we did deserve and we were heading to and some are in and others are still going to an e eternal hell because sin is committed against an infinite God. And therefore, it is an infinite unrighteous act. It is an infinite evil, an infinite, earning infinite guilt, uh, requiring infinite payment. And you and I are finite beings. We can't make infinite payments in any, even a, a, a trillion series of moments. We, we require an eternal time for a finite being to make an infinite payment to God's justice. 
And so hell awaiting us, it would have been an amazing mercy and would be today if somehow good news could be granted to those suffering for their sins. If they could hear, it's over. Anybody who's not a Christian, not a believer, is now going to be wiped out of existence and you'll pass into a black, unconscious void of non-existence. That would be, to those suffering or to those going to suffer, an infinite mercy. That would be amazing news and an extreme act of God's kindness. But God didn't just do that. Not only does he spare us from that, but then also clothes us with or adds to us his own dear son, Jesus Christ. He who he who saw us as enemies according to the law, he then not only disbanded that punishment and and got rid of that judgment, he gave us more even beyond that so that instead of just a black void that doesn't include punishment, we actually have in front of us awaiting a sure hope, which is an anchor for the soul planted in heaven, an eternal glory, infinite joy, face to face with our creator. That's the gospel. There's three things that we're going to look at. What does it mean to put on Christ, that a Christian has put on Christ? First of all, it is washing. Uh, uh, We have in our sin a filthiness, the Bible says, a dirtiness, an inappropriateness to try and access somebody clean, or the biblical word is holy like God. And so we require a washing, and that is really in the word picture of baptism. That's That's a word we use in the church, but its real meaning is immersion to be plunged underneath water. And so even in that uh, idea in the ancient world, they used that word for for dying things that they're pushing under the the dye water. They would would speak of a ship being sunken. It's immersed. It's baptizo. And so so even in that uh, uh, language of baptism, we need to see that there's, there's an analogy of washing. We who have put on Christ through baptism have been immersed into Jesus and washed of all of our sins. Uh, In Acts chapter 22, Paul is, like like the candidates just earlier, giving his testimony publicly. This is what I did. This is how I sinned. This is how God saved me. In Paul's testimony, Jesus shone like a star in his eyeballs. He went blind. He fell off his horse. He got led into a town uh, that he was going to kill Christians in. (laughs) And then one of the Christian leaders was visited by God and told, go and speak to ISIS leader, the the, the senior jihad operations manager. He would like to have lunch with you, Ananias. Ananias thought, yeah, I bet he would. He's got a very specific plan for me at lunch. Uh, uh, They're going to pat him down and do security on this guy because he's Saul of Tarsus who murders Christians. Nonetheless, he's obedient and he goes and he finds that Saul, uh, who would become known as Paul among the Gentiles, uh, Saul was repentant. He was trusting in Jesus. He had met Jesus in the, in the, the, the bright light. He had heard the words. He had understood now that he was sinning. And then Ananias says to him, well, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Wash away. There's the picture. You're filthy. You're dirty. Wash them away. And so baptism is this. But let's return to that earlier question. Is it baptism that washes away your sins? Now you go, well, do we want to disagree with what Tom said earlier or the Bible? Or could, I, could they be the same thing just said in a cryptic way? That's, that's my case. Baptism does not, in the act of water upon the skin, Peter says this, it's not as if removing dirt from the body in the armpits, that it somehow washes sins away. Here, in the rest of the sentence, here is how baptism saves you. Be baptized and wash away your sins, comma, calling on his name. So it is It is not that baptism saves or washes sins away. It is the calling on Jesus who washes you by his blood. That, that washes sins away. And it is is theoretically possible that somebody could be unconverted, uh, being preached to next to a body of water, and be converted on the way down and rise up calling on Jesus in their heart. And in the moment of their baptism, be saved. But it was not the baptism that saved. It was the calling on the name of Jesus And Ananias says here that that can be pictured as a washing away of sins. We we sing a hymn. It's an old hymn. Rock of ages, broken, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from from your wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me 
pure. So for every Christian, for every person who has laid hold of Jesus Christ and hopefully been baptized, you are washed of sin because you have put on Christ. And that's the cure-all for all future marks against your conscience. You will sin. You need not downplay those sins. You will fail. You will rebel. You will go again to sin like a dog to vomit. Uh, you will, you will uh, come dirty uh, in your feet and your hands and feel as if you are filthy before God. But the fact of Christ being placed upon you, you have put on Christ, in him you are washed, means that you are never truly dirty ever again in God's sight, no matter how many sins you commit. That's true. There are some cleaning agents, my wife tells me. There are apparently some cleaning agents that you spray and clean and the thing's clean. Yeehaw. Spray, wipe, it's clean. But then again, the kid comes along with a handful of mud, the cordial, the, the, the sauce, whatever it is. And then again, there is a, a spray, a wipe, a clean. A spray, wipe, clean. But there are some things that, that are so more potent, better designed, so it is not as if it is able to clean over and over and over again, but that in the initial cleaning, it also embeds into the fabric a kind of surface protector so that it can't get dirty again. There'll be spills upon it. There will be uh, uh, marks placed on it, but they will quickly fall off because of the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the capacity that the cleaning agent has actually placed upon the surface. And this is like the blood of Jesus for your soul. It's not as if he can clean you. And after you sin on your way home from your baptism, call on God again. He'll clean you again. Next Sunday, we'll worship again. We'll just sort of have a, have a, have a water uh, conga line going for all of us in and out of church, maybe, maybe fire spray uh, 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 hoses so that we can just all be baptized every week because apparently uh, when you sin, you need to be washed. No, your conscience is wrong. You don't need to be washed again. You are washed. Christians who sin don't need to put on Christ. You need to remember you have put on Christ and you are washed. Secondly, just as we are washed of our filth because of the blood of Jesus which cleanses, we are also clothed in Jesus Christ. This is the language of you have put on Christ. Now, sometimes in the New Testament, Paul uses that language to say, you're a Christian, dress like Jesus in your behavior, your speech, your language, your conduct. You should Dress up like Jesus. You know, put on your dad's clothes and look like him, work like him, act like him. That's not actually the sense in which we're using it today. There's other senses in the New Testament which more get along the lines of putting on Christ is a once for all change of nature, which is like uh, the, the dressing of clothes which never come off. There's a chapter in the Old Testament which prophesied the future salvation God would bring through Jesus. And it prophesied it through a high priest named Jesus. His Hebrew name sort of comes into English either as Jesus or Joshua. But for the sake of today, we'll, we'll leave it at Joshua. That's what it is in Zechariah 3. And Jesus, uh, sorry, Joshua, I've just corrected that. Uh, Joshua is in Zechariah 3, a high priest in this vision in the presence of God and his holy angel. And Satan is standing at his side to accuse him and say, he shouldn't be here. This high priest should get cut out, cast out, burned in the fire. Here's Satan doing God's bidding because he is the accuser. And he says, God, he's filthy. He's covered in dirt. His robes, his high priestly vestments, his turban, they're filthy. They should not be in God's presence. This was the old covenant law. Zechariah 3 reads like this in a vision of Zechariah. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. See, this is a picture of our natural state as human beings. Uh, regardless of whether you were baptized into some kind of church, how religious you were growing up, how Christian your family was, whether your grandma used to say certain prayers or Latin uh, uh, phrases over you in your crib, every one of us was uh, being brought forth even in our mother's womb and then into the world filthy because we shared in what the Bible calls original sin. The, the first sin of Adam is counted to all of us because he represented us. We're, we're a fallen race by nature. 
But then secondly, we go and commit. We add to that. No, no one's going to be punished just because of what Adam did. We certainly play our part. We willfully break God's law. We do things with our body, in our body, against our body. We do things against people. We hurt people. We take things, uh, drink things, abuse things. We uh, watch things. We listen to things. We read things that are breaking God's law. We have committed sins and added to our filthiness. We also, however, we omit things that we should do. Should be generous to someone and don't. Should be respectful to authority and don't. Should be kind to our neighbours and aren't. Should be loving when we should and aren't. So that we are guilt, we're filthy, we are marred, we are, we are dripping with tar and mud and, and uh, all kinds of disgusting fluids because of our nature, because of our acts, and because of what we failed to do. There's nothing about us by nature which is anything other than stained with sin. And so God gives that vision to the prophet. But then the angel of the Lord speaks. The angel said to those who were standing before him, <coughs> Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Zechariah, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. This is a picture of the gospel that the devil rightly points to you and says, sinner, guilty, hell deserving. The law of God says you don't make it to be allowed in heaven. You fall far short of God's standard, which is glorious and perfect. Our own mind becomes aware of this and we know we are fallen short. and We desperately wonder how could I clean myself up or get myself into heaven. Sometimes we become hopeless and we give up on all of that and we just resign ourselves to hopeless fairy tale atheism or some other kind of spiritualism. But the good news of God is that Jesus says, I will take away your clothes which are filthy. I will put onto you a perfect robe which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I will clothe you and make you fitting, make you acceptable, make you welcome in God's presence. The righteous robe that we receive is the pure righteous life of Jesus Christ, which he lived on earth. Ancient Christians used to uh, picture this by getting baptized and then rising out of the water and having a white robe put upon them. This is the picture that in Jesus Christ, if I have put on Jesus, I have put on an unstainable, perfect eternal righteousness in my presence before God. You can tell yourself, I have put on Christ, so I have access to God. I have put on Christ, so I have protection from God against accusation of the devil. I have peace with God. I have the love of a father that will never leave me or desert me. I have justification, redemption, reconciliation, and the Holy Spirit to preserve and empower me all because of Jesus' righteous robe put upon me. John Wesley wrote a hymn called The Lord Our Righteousness. The first verse says this, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Amidst flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Bold shall I stand in your great day, for what charges may the accuser lay, fully absolved through these I am from sin and fear and fear from guilt and shame. So unbelievers, we've talked about these two things, being washed and being reclothed in righteousness. The question becomes, have you trusted in, have you called on the name of, have you leaned into, have you had faith in Jesus Christ? And if you haven't, then you can know certainly today you don't have a righteous robe covering you. You're going to try and meet God in your own filthy garments and somehow foolishly hope you're the one exception he doesn't mind bending his rules for. No. no. Or, or you will, you'll try and come into his presence unwashed, unclean. And the call of Jesus Christ today is wherever you have been, just like the flood of Noah, Genesis tells us, covered every mountaintop. So also there is no deep valley or high sin that you have ever committed in your life that the blood of Jesus can't overwhelm, baptize, cover, and wash. You need to be found in Jesus Christ by trusting in him as the savior of your soul. Thirdly, though, there is a privilege of duty. All those who have had faith in Jesus and been baptized, Paul says, you've put on Christ. And there's blessings. And a third blessing 
is that there is a call to duty or there is a, a privilege of duty for those who have put on Christ. No matter where you go, no matter where you are, God is leading you. He is there with you and there Christ claims ownership over you and your actions. There you are, you are his, he is yours and he has his stamp of ownership over you as a son according to verse 26. We could look at all sorts of examples of... uh, I've read missionaries, uh, maybe militaries in the general, uh, uh, military leaders, I mean, uh, uh, political rulers, pastors, evangelists, uh, 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 simple, simple family people, uh, uh, all sorts of examples we could look to and say, look at this great cloud of witnesses of those who have shown what it means to live a life having put on Christ and going wherever Christ leads them. But just this last week, I was reading a, an autobiography of an evangelist from the 1800s And the story of his young teenage sister is what captivated me, and and I want to share it with you. W.G. Taylor was a man who came to Australia from England as an evangelist of the Methodists, and he saw amazing works of God in revival and churches started here in Brisbane, Ipswich, Toowoomba. But when he was back in England in the 1860s before he left, his young teenage sister had come to faith in Jesus Christ. When she was about 15, she, she, like we've been talking about today, she had this realization. I was born into a Christian family. I was uh, called a Christian from my birth, you know, raised up with Christian morals. I've been Christianly educated. I know the Bible. I've been singing the songs. I've been going to church. My dad's a Christian. My grandparents are Christians. My brother's an evangelist. But I'm outside of Jesus Christ. Every person needs to come to this realization that not only are your robes filthy, but other people's robes won't fit for you. Jesus hasn't given your father, your grandfather, your mother, your sister, your good friend. He's not given them his robes that he can then share it it with. You have to put it on for yourself by faith in Jesus. And Franny came to this understanding. She had not herself put on Jesus and she was still under the guilt of sin. So church started becoming a fearful, fearful time for her, uh, unpleasant in her heart, racking her conscience. And there was this one time after a prayer meeting where she couldn't, couldn't get up off her knees. She didn't want to leave until she knew, she knew that she was converted and saved. As she was sitting there praying, it was her brother William's joy to be able to come alongside her, point her to the Savior. He asked her, what kind of person did Jesus say he came for? She said, he came for sinners. He says, what kind of person are you, Franny? She said, I'm a sinner. And in that moment, her eyes opened. He came for me, I'm saved. Glorious day for William and Franny to make his sister of the flesh, sister for eternity. And, and then it was two years later that this, this evangelist came to town and the whole family got up, went into town. They were listening, but Franny stayed back at the house to, to keep house with one of the servants. Um, and as they were sort of mucking around in the house, she tripped and her temple caught a shelf and she fell down apoplectic, probably some kind of, some kind of stroke or subdural hematoma these days, we would call it a brain bleed. In the years that would come, she would only live three more years from that time, dying at around about 17 years of age. Uh, She began soon to lose her uh, speech, soon her sight, and then soon her hearing. William had said that before this accident and tragedy, she'd been such such a sensitive, anxious girl, but so full of joy that had to be shared with others. She was one who by God's uh, gift to her life and her uh, 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 salvation, she uh, speaks of her two years experience um, in in January 1867. She looks back on the last two years of being saved. Uh, She says, uh, she speaks of her last two years experience of the love of her saviour. I can say, she said, that God is my father. And because of that, these two years have been the happiest of my life. May God give me more of his grace. May I realize more of his love and may I be more watchful and prayerful. It was just soon after that in the weeks to come that she would have her tragedy. Doctors were baffled. She was attacked by neuralgia of a virulent type. Her senses, her nerves began to fire. 
Uh, doctors were baffled and all at home uh, were at the wit's end to try and know in what manner they could assuage the agony of her suffering. Along, the girl took to her bed, unable to, uh, to leave. She lay there for three never-to-be-forgotten years. Not one moment was she free from pain, at times of an excruciating character. Fearful and painful fits supervened, each one worse than that which preceded it. Within 12 months, she lost her eyesight. Blind and every moment in pain, never a murmur passed her lips. She was blessed by nature with a keen sense of humor so that she would make fun out of those who cried who loved her. <laughs> That's just younger sister energy right there. And people would come and see her suffering and tear up and cry and she'd mock them. You know, that's a sense of humor. Eminently English, eminently younger sister. Until soon, she lost her sense of speech. And then as an awful climax, a few months later, her sense of hearing. Think of it, suffering pain that at all times was indescribable, unable to see, speak, or hear, and yet the most cheerful soul in the house. 46 years have passed since she was called home, and I've traveled three times around the world, but I never have seen anywhere a more beautiful illustration of grace triumphing over the greatest difficulties. She, um, having lost all of her sight, hearing and speech, there was one point that as her hearing, the final uh, uh, sense which passed out, it says that she was struck with a, uh, a perturbedness and she was crying and she was, well, to be honest, feeling sorry for herself. I wouldn't condemn that. But she, in short order, stabilized herself and wrote down on her slate, forgive me, mother, it's not right to fret. Praise God that though I have lost my sight, I cannot see you or hear you or speak to you. Yet I have my fingertips. What, what gratitude to God. And then in short order, the, the way that her mother would read the Bible and read letters from her brother to her would be to tap on her fingers. They devised a kind of alphabetical system. It was painstaking. It was slow. They would get through it. And, and as the months went on, her fingers developed this hypersensitivity and this enlargement. Uh, doctors know what it's called these days. I don't. Uh, but it beca- her fingers became hypersensitive. And one day, her mother put down the letter on her lap because her fingers were so, so sore and excruciating. She put down the letter on her on daughter's lap and she walked off. And, and here she looks back and her daughter is beaming with joy. Tears coming down her face. She's handling her brother's handwritten letter. No braille then, no, no, such, no such invention. And then she's just touching the pages. She grabs her slate and she writes down, Mother, I can feel the letters of my brother William's pen on the paper. And then she starts writing out to prove she was writing out what her brother had said. And her mother, so filled with joy, called the doctors because... What is this? Obviously a miracle, but let's see if the doctor's, like, is she being healed? Is there something we can rehabilitate in this manner? And the doctor came, a man of science, to disprove and to dissuade any joy or hope in the family, he says. What a, what a guy. Just tremendous to have at Christmas, that kind of guy. And it says that he, um, uh, <laughs> uh, during her suffering, she was such an illustration of Patient, cheerful resignation. But when the doctor uh, came in, he, he brought this bundle of letters to disprove this silly joy. He says to throw away the, uh, the hope in the impossible. And he puts down his, uh, his professional letters on her lap and says to the mom, watch this, she can't read, you're dreaming it. And she, well, she picks it up, she's hand over the letter, she, she can't get past the first line. So like the, the introductory to doctor uh, so-and-so. And he's standing there. Told you so. And she grabs a slate, struggling, and writes down, they've made a mistake. You told me Dr. Surgeon Johns was here. They've written to Dr. Chemist Johns. Can you please explain? I mean, no doctor wants to be called a chemist. It's like being called a dentist. And he pulls it up and he looks... And he realizes they've, mis- they've misnamed him. That they did call me a chemist. My eyes didn't see it. Her hands evidently did. And there he said, I'm willing to believe anything in that moment. And he began to ask of the evangelist. So nonetheless, then she was able to read letters, like the, the inscribed marks of the pen 
in the paper became how she could read the Bible and letters from her loved ones and also send them to others. And she began, this is what uh, William says, what a ministry of sympathy and mercy was hers. Experienced Christians, missionaries, laymen, and ministers from far and wide came to witness what the grace of God could do. And they went away enriched by all they saw. When the fact came home to her, this is what we said before, that her hearing had left, she was perturbed and tears ran down her face. She said, forgive me, mother, it's wrong of me to fret. She, uh, uh, she employed her fingertips then in the king's business. She had this ministry called Leaves from the Garden. Her mother would bring her green pieces of paper. She would read. She would write down poems and particularly on the other side, Bible verses. She would put them in an envelope, a brown envelope. Um, and it was written with, uh, do you need a leaf from the garden? Please take one or two. And she sent it to William as this, sort of as he's evangelizing in ministry in a foreign nation. He would pull something that is sort of the, sort of the origin to like Christian key rings or mugs or Bumper stickers, right? Like the uh, Kurong sells them. She invented them. She should get all the royalties. It was like a, it was like a pick, pick a verse out and read it in your moment of need. And so he did. And this became a ministry that missionaries, ministers, pastors, uh, Bible school teachers would get them for young girls in their congregation. And she served the kingdom that way and encouraged many missionaries out on the field. This is the kind of the reason, you know, we're, we're looking at Franny. Why? Because she's an example that those who have put on Christ... Regardless of what will come and come what may, the Lord Jesus calls you to faithfulness, to glorious, majestic suffering on a mission field, to lead and rule and, 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 and lead many thousands, or to lay dying on a bed with full joy in the perseverance of the Spirit, still rejoicing in God's grace. A song that we sing here, How Firm a Foundation, says this, When through the deep waters I call thee to go. This is as if it's... It's written as if it's speaking from God to us. The rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you, thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathways shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flames shall not hurt thee, my only design, your dross to consume and your gold to refine. That soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Christian, to the baptized Christian, you have a duty placed upon you to live for and persevere in and honor Jesus Christ wherever he may lead you. You have been clothed in Jesus' righteousness and his pure robe, and you have been washed in his blood of all of your sin, because by faith you have put on Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this gift, this marvelous person, this hope, this salvation. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the perfect man, God the Son, the Lamb of God, everything that we needed, you supplied in Jesus Christ. We thank you that as Paul commends to us this morning a remembrance and a refreshing renewal of our mind to look back on what you have done in our salvation, in our baptism, in the, in the fact that we place our faith in Jesus Christ because your Spirit made us alive and then added us into Jesus. We have put on Christ, the most marvelous gem, the greatest gift that you could ever give, you have given to us to put on. We thank you for him, Lord God. And we ask for those who are in our midst who have not put on Christ, who in this moment are dirty, uh, are un, uh, undressed in righteousness, and who do not belong to Jesus, and we, they may not even realize it. So please, Holy Spirit, make them realize it. Make them feel their, their filthiness, their, their undressedness, their, their not belonging to Jesus and, and give to them a, a hope and a faith and a trust that leans on and that calls out to Jesus Christ. Please, Lord God, in this moment, would you save souls for eternity, just like you saved Franny, for whatever earthly future they may have for an eternal future in Jesus Christ, because by faith, we are all sons of God. We glorify you now and thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.